Good evening. Good evening. My name is Bob Adler. I'm the Dean of the S.J. Quinney College of Law, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 49th Annual Leary Lecture by Professor Larry Gostin, who will be formally introduced in a little while by my colleague, Associate Dean and Professor Leslie Francis. Um, now, referring to the 49th Leary Lecture um, is exciting. It suggests that we have a very large anniversary next year. We're going to do um, something special for that. But each of our Leary lectures over the past 49 years have been quite special in a different way, and we're looking forward to a very enjoyable evening um, tonight. Um, before Dean Francis introduces our 2015 Leary lecturer, I want to say a few words about the namesake of the program, uh, Dean, Dean William H. Leary, who served as Dean at the College of Law for a remarkable 36 years from 1915 to 1951. When I announced that last year, I was personally grappling with the idea of being dean for 36 weeks. <laughs> I finally surpassed that milestone, and now I'm still um, worried about 36 months. It still seems daunting compared to 36 years. He led us through World War I, the Great Depression, World War II, and into the Cold War. Um, he served us through five U.S. presidents, including FDR's three and a half terms. Um, he's a, he was a graduate of Amherst College um, and the University of Chicago Law School, and then he was appointed as our dean at the ripe old age of 34. Um, he was truly a foundational figure in the College of Law. He was a noted legal educator. He, um, he was famous for insisting that the College of Law should be a place of intellectual exchange and intellectual openness. Um, and here's what he wrote about this. He said that he would like to see a freer discussion of philosophical questions, a broader, more tolerant attitude, a deeper respect for others and their opinions, a richer culture, and a truly intellectual atmosphere. So it's in that spirit that this lecture series honors Dean Leary's um, desire um, for a speaker series in which we would bring the most talented legal minds in the nation um, to grapple with some of our most challenging problems. That's exactly what we've done over the years, and it's what we've done this evening. So in that tradition, I am pleased to welcome, invite my colleague, Leslie Francis, who is currently serving multiple roles as um, professor of law, professor of philosophy, associate dean for um, faculty research and development, and the director of our um, uh, Center for Law and Biomedical Sciences, and a prominent health law scholar in her own uh, scholar of public health law of our generation. Let me start with some conventional measures. He is university professor at Georgetown University, that university's highest honor, where he also directs the O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health Law, he is also professor of medicine at Georgetown, professor of public health at the Johns Hopkins University, and director of the Center for Law and the Public's Health and the Public's Health at Johns Hopkins in Georgetown. He's received many honorary degrees, honorary fellowships, both nationally and internationally. The Institute of Medicine's Adam Yarmolinsky Medal for Distinguished service in furtherance of science and health, the Public Health Law Association's Distinguished Lifetime Achievement Award, quote, in recognition of a career devoted to using law to improve the public's health, unquote, and my favorite, the Rosemary Delbridge Memorial Award from the United Kingdom National Consumer Council for, and again I quote, the person who has most influenced Parliament and the government to act for the welfare of society. What a, yeah, what a great, uh, yeah. Professor Gostin's impact on public health policy, both in the United States and globally, is profound. To take just a few illustrations, in the US, he's well known for developing the model emergency 
Health Powers Act to combat bioterrorism, and the Turning Point Model State Public Health Act. He currently chairs the Institute of Medicine Committee on Nas National Preparedness for Mass Disasters. Globally, he's working tirelessly to improve global health governance. In this respect, he's recently developed a framework convention on global health, a multilateral treaty to ensure basic survival needs for the world's poor. In April 2011, these efforts were endorsed by the UN General Secretary Ban Ki-moon. In, in 2012, an independent empirical analysis of legal scholarship ranked Professor Gostin first in productivity among all law professors in the United States. Clearly, That's why I'm uh, prematurely old. <laughs> 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 Clearly, an introduction cannot list all of them. Uh, what I can try to do is give you a sense of their overall breadth and depth. His books and articles treat the rights of patients with mental illness and mental disabilities, the Americans with Disabilities Act, surrogate motherhood, human rights, HIV in the law, confidentiality, improving state infectious disease laws, genetics policy and law, biosecurity, public health law, and most recently, global health law. Throughout his work, he sounds the themes of individual rights and equity as inextricably, as inextricably linked to the critical goal of protecting the health of all of us. Let me pick just two of Professor Gostin's books to illustrate his commitments to justice and to health. Uh, a personal aside, both of these books were on the shelf next to my desk where I keep books that I refer to often. So they were ready to hand Surprise. and easy to find. Uh, his long-standing efforts on behalf of people with intellectual disabilities and mental illness were given powerful voice in the collection that he edited with Stanley Herr and Harold Coe the human rights of persons with intellectual disabilities. In the introduction, he wrote of the importance of recognizing the human rights of not only <coughs> visible minorities, but also, quote, invisible, underprotected minorities, particularly persons living with HIV AIDS, gays and lesbians, and persons with physical or mental disabilities, unquote. And, in, I brought a show and tell, Global Health Law, global, sorry, yes, Global Health Law, published in 2014 by Harvard University Press, which he just reported to me took five years to write, and I can certainly believe it. Uh, Professor Gostin masterfully details how to imagine global governance for health with health equity and global solidarity. He writes, Global health with justice will only come once the existing architecture incorporates the vision of a collective population-based approach to health for us all. Please join me in welcoming Professor Larry Gostin. Thank you. That was lovely. Thank you. It's just wonderful to have you here. What a lovely introduction. Thank you so much. Um, I'm a little older than 32, really, um, but it feels very old. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, imagining global health with justice um, today. And I, I suppose that this imaginary uh, justice or injustice, in this case injustice, really emerged during the Ebola uh, uh, epidemic, um, one of the most avoidable, unconscionable episodes uh, in recent human history, in my view. Um, and there'll be a lot of retrospectives on it. I'm, I'm on several commissions, and WHO is looking into it as well. Um, so I thought what I would do is I would talk a little bit about uh, global health with justice and how we could imagine it. 
And then I'll use Ebola as a lens. And I'll probably just talk about Ebola for a very short amount of time, but you might want to have a, a discussion of that during our uh, uh, question and answer period. One of the things I've realized uh, over the last several months is, is that there are two very distinct global health narratives. And what interests me about these two glo global health narratives is, is that they're opposite. But what is most interesting is, is that they're both true. If you can imagine something that's both true and opposite. So one is a global narrative that is told by all of the great and good in global health. Margaret Chan, WHO, Jim Kim at the World Bank. Um, uh, Bill Gates is, was on a charm offensive on television uh, bringing this narrative, Michael Bloomberg and, and others. And this is a narrative that basically says how far we've come in global health and that we really should not give up and that, that the quadrupling uh, in global health funding over the last 10 years really has made a difference. And if you look at the Millennium Development Goals, uh, and particularly the AIDS, the health-related goals, you find that we've made enormous progress. And now, of course, uh, in September of this year, uh, the UN uh, General Assembly will meet um, to form uh, the the successor to the uh, MDGs, which are now going to be called the Sustainable Development Goals. But if you look at this narrative, you see one of remarkable progress. Uh, women are dying much less uh, in childbirth. Infants are living a lot longer. Uh, what used to be the rallying call that every child has the right to live to five has come true. Most and it's projected um, that child that, that under five um, mortality rates in low and middle income countries are on, a, are on a trajectory to be near higher income countries um, within the next ten years if if we maintain the same progress. We have millions of people on uh, antiretroviral medications for HIV. Uh, we've made enormous strides with um, tuberculosis, uh, with malaria. Uh, all told, we've really done remarkably well. Now, most of that success tracks the Millennium Development Goal targets. Um, what's been left behind, I think, are, is the epidemiological transition from these major endemic infectious diseases to non-communicable diseases, cancer, heart disease, diabetes, respiratory illness. And there, um, we're seeing 65% of the global burden of disease uh, in non-communicable diseases. And we're also seeing a transition not only from infectious to non-infectious, but we're also seeing a trans transition from having these so-called lifestyle disease um, move from high-income countries like the United States, where you see a lot of obesity, diabetes, and the like, um, to all over the world, um, whether it's India, Bangladesh, Asia, Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, we're seeing this transition. The other thing that hasn't changed are injuries. Um, while high-income countries have reduced injuries, particularly road traffic um, crashes and deaths um, considerably. Uh, these have just been rising. And if any of you have traveled to, to Delhi um, or Beijing or Dhaka um, or uh, Kampala, uh, you would know why. It's really scary on the roads there. <laughs> uh, and so you have this global health narrative that really suggests that we've done awfully well um, as an international community in tackling particularly uh, those diseases that are targeted um, by the health-related Millennium Development Goals of the United Nations. Now, but there's another narrative, and this is the narrative that I see all of the time when you mentioned the Framework Convention on Global Health. We, this is really a bottom-up civil society 
led movement, uh, even though Ban Ki-moon and uh, Michelle, Michelle Sidibe, who's the head of UNAIDS, have endorsed it, it still really comes up from civil society, between, particularly Southern civil society. So I spend a lot of my time um, in very, very poor countries um, working with civil society groups. Uh, and they have a completely different narrative of what their life is like. And their life is one of su deep, deep suffering, illness, uh, violence, uh, and uh, uh, disability. And so when I was finishing that, uh, the Global Health Law book, um, I said to Harvard University Press, OK, well, let's, let's have a forward. And so they said, well, who do you have in mind? I said, well, you know, I, um, Michael Bloomberg will do it, um, or we could have Margaret Chen. You know, we could have any of the great and good. They'll, they'll, they'll write it. Um, Harvard said, no, nobody cares what they think. <laughs> and so they said, go back <clears throat> and think of another idea. So I scratched my head, and I scratched my head, and I came up um, with the beginning of the book, um, something that I call Global Health Narratives. <clears throat> so I went either personally or through my civil society partners, and I interviewed young people all around the world. And among those young people, we just literally asked them the question, just tell us in your own words what your life is like. And so we, I gathered those together for the global health narratives at the beginning of the book. It's the best part of the book because I didn't write it. <clears throat> but it's really very touching. And I thought I would read you um, two. <clears throat> One is um, from uh, Nira, Nira Mibu, uh, And she's a young woman, and she's living in Gaba, uh, which is a suburb of Kampala in Uganda. And she writes, I live in a very rowdy place. No clean water, no good toilets or bathrooms. I have to move a long distance every day looking for clean water to bathe, to cook. At night, the conditions worsen. There's hardly any electricity. The mosquito noise fills up the place. Cockroaches move around me, and this makes me sick. Even when I fall ill, I hardly ever go to hospital. My mother, who would have helped me out with the medication fees, is living with HIV AIDS. Life is too hard and complicated for me. I have to cook food for my brother and myself. This is for, forces me to cook one meal a day because I lack the money to access all the food I need to be healthy and for my brother as well. And as a woman, a lot of violence happens to me and my friends. We were raped and robbed, and our property was stolen. I'm thinking of getting a job, but I know the salary is going to be too small. I'm so sad. I need a new life. And that's, you know, it was very, very touching. And, I, and it was a very common theme that I heard. But one of the things that I wanted to convey um, to people, particularly in the United, in North America and Europe, uh, is that illness and poverty and this kind of other narrative of injustice is not just over there. It actually exists here. Uh, and there are many, many people among us who have the same problems. And, if, and, if, and this, it's not only in the United States, I and mean, if you look at uh, emerging economies like India or Brazil or South Africa. And in fact, if you look at middle income countries full stop, you will actually find that they have a higher percentage of rich people than we do here. So a lot of the world's population is rich there, and a lot are very, very, very poor. And the same thing is true here. And so I was doing a lot of work on a, um, an American Indian um, reservation uh, in Montana called Blackfeet Tribal Reservation. I hope you'll ask me some questions about that, because it was a real eye-opener for me. <clears throat> and in that reservation, 
Can you guess what the average life expectancy of a male at birth is? 47. Um, <clears throat> and uh, there were, at the time I was there in the um, Indian Health Service Hospital that uh, served the reservation, of all of the babies born, 60% of the babies who were, were born either with fetal alcohol syndrome or their parents had, um, uh, were, had, had drugs. And so there's, so there's a whole next, next generation gone. And so I, and the women are completely powerless there, completely and utterly powerless. Please ask me about that during the break. <clears throat> But I did talk to a male, um, a young boy named Johnny. <clears throat> and uh, when, I, when, I, when I tell the story in other countries, that they quite like it because I put on my twangiest American accent. <clears throat> but I'll try to do that for you, too. I start my, I start my days with a cup of joe. <clears throat> then I corral, ride, and break horses. And I smoke a bowl of weed about six or seven times, if I have it. Otherwise, I smoke whatever shows up. It's a stress reliever. My father uses drugs, snorts cocaine in front of me, takes my birthday money. He even did a line of coke with me, and he's used alcohol since before I was born and gambled. My dad was abusive to all of us. He was verbally abusive and beat us also with a belt. When your family is broken due to drugs and alcohol, everyone is hurt. It makes me mad when people in the community do the heavier drugs. What I mean is, what little kids get to eat or not to eat? Did they get their shoes or clothes they needed? It depends on whether the adults do drugs. And here's the same hopelessness as Nimurubu. I know it can't be stopped. But it's unfair that grown-ups get what they want and the children do without. I want to shout, hey, when you do meth, don't let your kids be there. If I could, I would turn our reservation into a dry reservation and no gambling. My life is gone, but what about the kids? So it's very interesting, I think, therefore, that you have these two narratives. And the, these two narratives, are they're both true, they're both opposite. But to me, they demonstrate why I entitle my, um, the themes in my book and this talk, Global Health with Justice, and rather than just Global Health Justice. Because the truth is, you can have global health or you can have justice but you can actually have them independently. In other words, you can have a state of very good global health without justice. And you can actually have equity, justice, we talked about this last night at dinner. You can actually have equity with a, with, with a very low base of global health. Um, and so, I, and I'll be explaining more about th this idea of global health with justice, but an ideal world would be a world where we would achieve global health, which is the highest level that's realistically achievable in terms of health, um, longevity, um, and physical robustness, and uh, physical and mental robustness, that is trying to have low levels of disability. So for example, in the United States, um, and my, wi my wife and I were just talking about this uh, uh, a couple of days ago, um, you know, she said, well, you know, with all the diabetes and everything in the United States, this next generation is going to be the first one that's going to live shorter than us. I said, no. They'll live the same amount of time as, as our generation did. They'll just live with more disability. Um, and so it gives you an idea of what you should strive for. And, and, and for me, when I talk about population health and global health, what I, what I mean, I, I don't do it because I want to save health care costs. First, because I don't think it will. And second, that's not the main issue. 
I don't necessarily even do it so that we can live as long as we possibly can. Remember your 90-year-old who, who uh, just wanted to die? Was that you or Peggy who said that? Peggy. Um, uh, so I don't do it for that. I do it because uh, being healthy um, and having a sense of well-being is so very important. That's, it's important for my life, and I think it's important for every pe person's life. So I begin the final chapter of the book um, by uh, giving myself permission to do something that sometimes scholars say you shouldn't do, and I say you should do it. Scholars like, and particularly in law schools, I think, Dean, you'll, you'll appreciate this, particularly in law schools, we, we, we want to make things as nuanced and as complex as we possibly can. Um, I think those of you who are in law school know. Um, and that actually can be a good thing. But I had spent, whatever, 14 chapters in five years writing something that was really nuanced and complex. And so I gave myself permission in the final chapter to oversimplify intentionally oversimplify. And I find that as a scholar, sometimes oversimplification gains such clarity. In fact, when I talk to my students about writing, I, I, I make them state very, very simply what their thesis and their ideas are first. It's amazing how they can't do it because they're always confused by the complexities. But if you state it first or last, and then spend the rest being nuanced and complex, I think it, it actually is highly explanatory. So I gave myself permission. And, and, I, and I, I said to myself, um, if we could answer three questions, just three questions, we would have a state of, uh, that I would be happy with in the world in terms of health. And they're, so, they're, they're very simple questions, but I'm, I think they're, they're simple, in this, but nobody answers them right. So the first question is, what would global health look like? That is, if we, how do we know when we've achieved success? And what are our goals? Um, and I'm going to explain that, although I have a very clear idea what our goal ought to be, that's not at all the goal of the global health system. In fact, it's far from it. And it's also not the goal that we give for philanthropy, charity, international assistance, and all the like. The second question is, what would a state of global health with justice look like? That if we added the, the, uh, we, we added the layer of justice onto this perfect or ideal state of global health. And then the third question is, how would we get there once we knew? So I'm going to cover the first two. And the, how we get there, you have to buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually not a bad book. It looks very complex and difficult. But when it was reviewed by the Times in London, the first, I love the very first sentence. They said, this is not a boring book. <laughs> <laughs> Because, because the Times told me that they, were, that they, never, they never review um, academic books. you know, And then they read it. They liked it. They sent it out. And that was the very first sentence. So um, let's begin with uh, what would an ideal state of global health look like? Um, I posit that there are three things that make a population healthy. Um, and we don't do any of these three, <laughs> these three things uh, in, uh, in our global health system. The first thing is, is that you want to have universal access to high quality health care. That happens um, to be the, the least robust of the three things I'm going to mention, but it is important. And you might be, feel surprised that I say that we don't do that, but we don't. 
Um, if you look at just the United States' international development assistance for health, if you look at the budget of the World Health Organization, if you look at the Global Fund, if you look, maybe the Gavi Alliance is a little bit better, but uh, not that much better, Unitaid, all of the major great, uh, the World Bank, we don't actually provide um, uh, a, a health system infrastructure that's horizontal. We tend to um, silo it. We'll get people on antiretroviral medication if they've got AIDS. We'll get people on anti-tuberculosis medication, or we'll give them um, uh, a second or third tier uh, drug if they've got uh, MDR-TB or extremely drug-resistant um, TB. Um, we'll work on um, child survival or um, uh, or maternal um, uh, or maternal uh, 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 women giving birth. Um, well, we we don't invest in strong health systems. We'll spend a lot of money in Haiti um, after an earthquake. Um, we'll spend a lot of money in West Africa, belatedly, um, but now um, uh, tens of billions of dollars projected um, there. But again, it's for Ebola treatment. We're going we're gonna to leave that country, that we're going to leave the three affected countries, Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia, in a worse state than before Ebola. Um, because we'll, we, we may get to zero Ebola cases, but I doubt it because I think it's going to be endemic in, in Guinea and Sierra Leone, and we might get to zero uh, in, um, uh, in uh, Liberia. But nonetheless, um, their health systems were impoverished. There were three post-conflict states, impoverished health systems. Um, they had, uh, of the minimal level of doctors, nurses, midwives, community health workers, of the very minimal bare bones level recommended by the World Health Organization and, um, uh, and others, uh, they had um, something like 0.05% of the minimum level, and, they've lo and, their, and their health workforce was devastated because they died um, with Ebola. So we'll walk away from that. We'll have gotten Ebola under control, I think, I hope, um, but we won't have built their health system. So universal health coverage is one. Uh, universal health coverage means that you would get um, essential medicines, primary care, um, specialized care, emergency care when you need it. Um, it wouldn't all be in the same level as uh, you would in, in a very, very good hospital in the United States, but, but, uh, but I think the World Health Organization would like to see universal health coverage. That would be the first. The second are population-based services, um, public health services. Um, these are services that um, involve um, uh, infectious disease control, sanitation, hygiene, um, uh, reducing uh, vectors like malaria uh, or, or uh, rats or garbage. Um, uh, it involves um, uh, control of injuries through um, uh, uh, safety. Uh, all of the kinds of things that a public health agency uh, is supposed to do. That is a much more robust um, uh, uh, benefit for the health of the population. And I'm going to explain why in a minute uh, about why it is so robust. And I hope you'll agree with me because I'm going to do a thought experiment with you and see if you, what, your, um, uh, what your conclusions would be. And the third thing um, are the socioeconomic determinants of health. Um, so these are education, uh, gender equality, um, uh, income uh, support, um, uh, jobs, uh, all the things that really make a population healthy. I mean, m almost all the data show us that the greatest net benefit um, for healthy populations is the third, or the social 
determinants of health. They're very, very powerful. i give you a good example. Have any of you been to Washington, D.C.? Do you, do you know the red line in Washington, D.C.? It goes from poor southeast all the way up to northwest um, Bethesda, the NIH, and the like. For every stop on the red line, you gain four years of life expectancy. Just to give you an idea. Uh, and it's not just, um, it's not just absolute uh, um, uh, uh, high, um, it's not high economic status. It's, you actually have to have a certain status compared to your peers. So it turns out that if you're nominated for an Academy Award, or if you win the uh, Sundance Film Fest Festival, um, you live longer than if you're not nominated. And if you win, you live longer than if you don't win. <laughs> um, so social status, as well as economic status, make a very, very big difference in health. But I'm going to take socioeconomic determinants off the table. And the reason I am is not because they're not important. They're extremely important. But the reason is, is that they have very little, if anything, to do with the health sector. They're not part of the health system, the health sector. And so I just want to look at these two issues, health systems and, um, and public health services. Now, I've spent my entire life trying to explain to anybody who will listen uh, about why public health is undervalued. In the United States, we spend about less than 5% of our health dollars on public health. That's true everywhere. Um, but there is, even though we spend that amount, little amount, we still, as a political community, won't tolerate certain public health failures. Now, I used to give a hypothetical example of that, but the hypothetical example actually came true, so now it's a true example. So I used to say, well, suppose in the United States you turned on your tap water uh, and it made everyone sick. Of course, that happened in West Virginia. Because nobody even cares about the District of Columbia when there was lead in the water and our little kids in the district would, were, were drinking it. Um, but it was on the front page of the New York Times every day. There's just certain things we won't tolerate, and yet we, they're perfectly acceptable everywhere else in the world. It's not, it's not how we organize our global health assistance at all. So I've tried to explain why this is important, and I, I never succeed. Not only don't I succeed in the United States, I don't even succeed with my civil society partners. Why? And the reason is, is because Healthcare is so tangible. When you're ill, you have a right to a, something. We talked about the right to health last night as well. Where did the right come from? The, the right isn't to health. The right is to a, to a medicine, to a treatment. Um, and no matter how much it costs, we'll spend whatever it takes to get the little girl out of the well. Or we'll give, it, as they did at Duke University, two heart transplants to a little girl. Or, and it's just, it, it's, it's the way it is. I mean, I, do you remember, uh, I don't know, was it about a year ago when um, a little girl um, uh, needed a liver transplant and she, um, uh, and, and she couldn't get it because she couldn't go on the adult um, transplant list? And then it went to a court and the court forced them to do that. Well, I went on television and I said it was a very unwise decision and that court should not be making those decisions. Of course, I came home and my wife hated me. <laughs> I was right, but she, well, I mean, I'm a husband anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, but she was very angry. Uh, and so it's, it's visible. We're not going to spend, we might spend millions or tens of millions on an identifiable cute little girl but we won't on a hundred faceless um, uh, young inner city people that need vaccines, just for example. 
Uh, and don't get me started on the measles vaccine. <laughs> That's my next talk. Um, <clears throat> so I've been trying to figure out a way to try to explain to people why public health is more important. And I, it, it occurred to me how I could do that um, when I came back um, from a very, very uh, poor African city, and I'll come back to that later. But I thought of a Rawlsian thought experiment. I mean, everybody knows John Rawls. Um, he had a theory of justice, um, so you would be in a veil of ignorance. And it basically, I mean, again, oversimplifying, of course, any one of us have to oversimplify and fly John, John Rawls because he was really a rock star and very, very good. Um, but basically, he said, you know, if, if you don't know the circumstances you're in, you're more likely to choose the just choice. Um, so imagine you don't know if you're rich or poor, white or black. You don't know if you live in Dhaka and Bangladesh uh, or Salt Lake City. Um, you don't know if you're um, a, a male or a female, although John Rawls didn't include um, that. Uh, in other words, you don't know if you're um, disabled or physically uh, able. You don't know if you're sick or well, old or young. Uh, faced with that choice, with, with that situation, I, I'm going to give you two stark choices, and you can choose the one that you would want. Um, so the first one is the, uni is, is the ideal state of health care. You could go to any hospital in the country at any time. Uh, you could get whatever medicines, the new um, uh, genetic medicines for cancer or the bio, uh, biological medicines. You could get what, any operation, any heart transplant, anything you needed um, when you became ill. Uh, and so you could do that, or you could never see a doctor again. But you would wake up every morning, and you'd turn on your tap, and there'd be clean water. You'd go into your kitchen, and your food would be safe and nutritious. You'd walk outside, and your vehicle would be roadworthy, and you'd have a seat belt and airbags and decent roads. Um, you wouldn't be attacked by malarial infected or dengue infected mosquitoes. Um, you wouldn't have bubonic rats, although I don't know if you heard NPR recently. They said it wasn't really the rats. And it was actually the gerbils, the cute little gerbils uh, <laughs> that, 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 uh, that did the plague. But you wouldn't have any of the vectors of disease. In other, you wouldn't have horrible you know, uh, emissions out of uh, cars that uh, choked you. In other words, you'd have an ideal state of public health. So between those two stark choices, how many would choose the health care? And how many would choose the public health? Yeah, and I've done, I've done this uh, exercise in Beijing, in Delhi, in Kampala, in Johannesburg, uh, in Buenos Aires, uh, in Hanoi, um, and the United States, all over Europe, no audience ever makes a different decision, although sometimes you have one or two hands go up, um, normally because they're not playing by John Rawls's rules. Because <laughs> <laughs> obviously, if you're ill, you would want the health care. Um, and that, the, the reason I came up with that is that I, I mentioned I had come back from a sub-Saharan African country, and I just wasn't feeling well. I was walking on uh, the c &O Canal in Washington with my wife, and we were talking. I was just unwell. Um, I didn't have um, malaria, which, I, which a lot of my friends do come back with. Um, I didn't have really bad food poisoning, but I had a, I was very asthmatic because of all the, the diesel fumes. Um, my stomach wasn't right, right, quite. I had an, a little bit of a headache. And I realized that whenever I came back from a, a low, lower-income country, I felt bad. 
it's not, and I've never seen a doctor in any of them or not seen a doctor in either the rich countries or the small ones. It had nothing to do with that. It's just because of the quality of life. But hey, I spent the morning here in Salt Lake City. I feel good. <laughs> I feel real good. You know, I go, I go to um, uh, Oslo. Nice. <laughs> Melbourne, I'm in heaven. There's something about the environment in which you live, the, physic, the built environment, the physical environment, the natural environment, that makes a difference. And it's not medicine. Uh, and so I posit that public health services would be important. So if I were going to have an ideal state of global health, it would be to give a universal access to reasonable, high quality health care, and also to have all of the population-based services um, that I talked about. Um, and as I mentioned, we don't give almost any attention globally to the public health services. And even for the health care services, it's siloed by particular treatments or by particular uh, humanitarian assistance in a crisis, uh, whether it's a flu or in Ebola. Um, the WHO is, uh, I mean, I, I don't know exactly the, the amount, but the WHO's budget, something like 35% of it, is devoted to polio eradication. Six cases of wild polio a year. That's what Bill Gates gives for the Rotary, uh, the United States, and others. Um, and yet, for non-communicable diseases, it's about 6% of its budget compared to a 65% global burden of disease. Injuries is negligible. Mental health, which has a huge burden of disease around the world, literally, as long as I've been working with WHO, there are two people in the mental health unit. Um, and so I think that gives you, gives, you, uh, gives you a sense. So that would be what my state of global health would look like. But remember, you can have reasonably high states of global health and not have justice. Um, so what, what would it take to get to justice? Well, if you think about justice, there's usually philosophers, we've got some darn good ones in the room. If you think about justice and you asked uh, the smartest people, which happen to be here in, 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 in Salt Lake City, about what it takes, most, I think, would answer a word that no politician would ever say, including President Obama. It begins with an R. Redistribution, exactly. President Obama believes in it. He wants to tax the rich, et cetera, et cetera. But he would never say it because it's politically toxic. And there is no question that you do need more redistribution to achieve uh, the goal of justice. But one of the things that occurred to me about the public health approach is, is that you can get a good way toward justice, not all the way, but a good way toward justice without redistribution because it's embedded in our physical and natural environment. So if there are no malarial mosquitoes, doesn't matter if you're rich or old or young or, or uh, rich or poor or young or old, you won't be exposed to them. If, there is, if the water's clean, um, if you don't have the rats, if the roads are safe, all of these things can rebound to the benefit of everyone. And so you can, you can embed justice in your environment. And I think that's another thing of commendation in terms of um, uh, the public health approach. Now, you still have barriers, uh, barriers for persons with phys physical or mental disabilities. Um, you'll still have barriers in terms of rural access and a whole range of other things. So you will need to dismantle barriers and do redistribution to get to justice. But embedding it in our environment is a really good first step. Um, so our goal is global health with justice. Um, and 
I'm not going to talk much about how to get there because I said you had to read the book. I want to, how much time do I have? Am I out of time completely? OK. So, so why, don't I, why don't I try to apply some of these lessons to Ebola? Um, in, my, in my judgment, um, for, for me, Ebola was, was one of the saddest global health spectacles that I have ever seen. Um, not because it killed a lot of people. And in fact, I had a lot of my friends in the AIDS community or in child maternal health, people who I love and respect and admire, um, who would say to me, you know, why are you spending all this time on Ebola and all of this um, passion? Um, it only, you know, kills just 10,000 10, people. Um, and, you know, AIDS and other things, just so much more consequential. And that really irritated me. Tell you the other thing that irritated me is all my friends who only wanted to know about whether they were safe from Ebola in the United States. Um, and if you want to know why that irritated me, just ask. But it did. In fact, my wife said I was very, very rude to one of our friends. Um, why? Well, first of all, you had a fast-moving epidemic in the world's poorest countries where the population uh, was deeply distrustful of their governments for good reason. Uh, they were in post-conflict. They had suffered greatly. And it was highly preventable. There have been 20 outbreaks of Ebola in the past. They've all been rapidly been brought under control as we did in the United States, in Spain, uh, even in um, Nigeria. Uh, but these were very poor countries. And it was the first time that Ebola went to countries which, with such fragile health systems. And it embedded itself in highly dense, very, very poor cities, uh, and then spread. It took the WHO a half a year after the first international spread, not just national, international spread of Ebola, to declare a public health emergency of international concern under the international health regulations. Uh, the funding levels were pitifully low. The political attention was pitifully low until when? until a US aid worker was medically evacuated and given a state-of-the-art treatment that wasn't given to people in West Africa. Uh, in the end, the United States was a hero um, for what it did. I remember, my, I'm not known in my family for being rah-rah America. Uh, particularly, my kids don't like, like it at all because I'm you know, very global. Um, but I happened to be on, um, oh, it's, it's called the PBS NewsHour. I was just saying Neil Lear. It's a very old PBS NewsHour, the day and, uh, on Ebola. And that was the day President Obama announced that he was sending troops. And so the, uh, uh, the reporter said to me, Judy Woodruff said, um, what do you think of, you know, we're sending the military into Liberia. You know, what do you think of that? And I, I said, God, I wasn't expecting the question. And so I paused and I said, I'm very proud of America. It actually makes me tear up because we were really there for the first time and it mobilized everything. Um, then the United States uh, led a, a Security Council resolution. It was the very first Security Council resolution um, uh, to declare an infectious disease a, a threat to international peace and security. Uh, that mobilized uh, the community. The very next day, Ban Ki-moon uh, formed UNMIR, the UN uh, 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 mission on um, Ebola in West Africa. And then finally, uh, uh, the World Bank, Jim Kim, um, stepped up 
uh, and even WHO very belatedly. Uh, right now, uh, there is a, a post-mortem uh, at WHO about what went wrong. And I think I won't go into that, but, it, but I would love if you wanted to discuss it during the question and answer why WHO has lost so much legitimacy and confidence and why Ebola really demonstrated that. Uh, and I have very, very clear ideas about how uh, one could, um, could um, fix that. And I think it's very, you know, it's very, very clear. Um, and maybe for the first time it will happen. I was, um, uh, I, I'm on a commission uh, at, uh, that's being set up uh, by the World Bank, WHO, and um, the National Academy of Sciences here. And, spent just a few days ago um, all day with uh, Jim Kim and Ban Ki-moon, not Ban Ki-moon, uh, Maga Chan. Uh, and I think for the first time there's a seriousness of purpose. Um, the, uh, the goal now is to get to zero cases. As I've said, I, I think there's a risk, um, even though it's not being said publicly, that Ebola will become endemic um, in uh, two out of these three countries. Uh, and probably most likely in Guinea, but also very possibly Sierra Leone, because although the case count was going down in the last couple of weeks, it's gone back up. Uh, if that happened, I think it would be very, very serious. But longer term, it's really essential that we devote ourselves to good public health and health care systems in the world's poorest countries. That's going to be not only the way um, uh, in our own self-interest to contain rapidly uh, spreading emerging diseases like influenza, Ebola, uh, MERS, um, uh, and, 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 uh, and, and, and chick virus uh, uh, in, in South America. Um, but it's also a way to keep a population health and safe, and safe, and that's extremely important. So with that, why don't I um, stop. Uh, I think uh, we're just we have a little bit of time for discussion, and uh, the uh, pleasure to do that. Thank you. Thank you very very much. Uh, the floor is open. I think you're coming to Utah, you've come to the right place to tell us about health care. <laughs> I wonder if you can uh, tell more about your experience with the Blackfoot Indian. Yeah. We, we have uh, the Navajo Reservation here in Utah, and it's my understanding that's a, a matriarchal society with the women in charge. All right. Well, Blackfeet is exactly the opposite there. Um, <clears throat> I, get, you know, I can give you... I can give you uh, a few examples. Well, I told you about what it was like, but let me tell you a little bit more what it's like on, on that reservation. First of all, it's in a beautiful part of Montana, just right outside their borders. It's gorgeous. Um, but the, all, all the tribal uh, elders care about is more money for the Indian Health Service, the hospital there. So I was in the hospital. Right, and I was asking, well, what, what are they pumping into the stream right outside of the hospital? Raw sewage. The kids were playing out in their uh, neighborhoods at school time, because it was a school day, um, with rubbish everywhere, and there were also sewage there. Nobody cared about the public health approach. I wanted to eat something, and I literally couldn't eat. Um, they were uh, serving uh, cake for breakfast, um, pe pepperoni pizza for snack. For lunch, I was starving. So they had um, a burrito uh, thing, which I said, OK, I'll have the beans and rice. None of that. I went to the supermarket. There was literally nothing I could eat. And nobody cared. All the men were either drunk, not all, most of them were either drunk, uh, on drugs, and or gambling. Uh, the tribal leaders didn't want to hear anything about it. The women were outraged. 
And they were telling me about it. And I said, well, why, why can't we do something? And we couldn't. And so I said, well, wait a minute. And I took the, the women, the health leaders, the women health leaders, and we confiscated the, um, uh, the Blackfeet radio station. And I let them just talk. But uh, in the end, um, uh, it was a, an Indian Health Service funded project. And I said to them, thinking that it would work, I said, you know, unless, unless you let me really help you, I don't want to be here. And so they said, OK, don't be here. Thank you. So uh, I'm a surgeon, but I'm also a public health person. And, uh, but I look at it through a surgical lens. But I, I would say that um, my understanding in Liberia with Ebola, and I understand this because my brother has runs a program there, a WASH program, which is uh, water sanitation and hygiene, that in the communities that bought into the concept of water sanitation and hygiene, in other words, they became open defecation free in Liberia. In those communities that they had successfully met the standard for uh, open defecation free, there were no Ebola deaths. So, that's a public health approach that's preventive, but it's community-based. And it enables a discussion long before there is, for example, immunization. But it sets the framework to allow all of these other interventions to come in as necessary, even before, say, electricity. Um, although the price of diesel, I would say, and you mentioned it, although you talked about diesel as you know, being bad for your, your lungs and all. But in my 25 years of experience in low resource countries, the price of energy in diesel has a huge impact on every hospital and every district hospital, health center, and everywhere else because that's where you do or do not get electricity at night. It impacts child uh, health, um, maternal health, and every other health. So as you look at it, if you look at the energy sector and its impact on health care, how can you budge the needle on those kinds of policies that have direct impact? Well, well that was beautifully spoken, I thought. Um, and the first part um, speaks for itself. It doesn't need an answer because you, you gave a wonderful illustration of the public health approach. <clears throat> On, in terms of energy, um, I think your good dean will probably be able to answer this question better than me. But I've heard very recently um, some really, really smart public health people say that um, middle income, particular, I'm doing some work now in the Emro region of WHO, the Eastern Mediterranean region, uh, and they up there in particular, but it's true everywhere and, and a lot of other places, uh, that, that, that fuel subsidies are actually one of the worst things for, for um, the environment and global health. Um, <clears throat> now, if you need electricity and it's for hospitals and, and other essential things, there's ways to do that to subsidize though, those particular areas, but I think a general subsidy. The other thing about a subsidy um, uh, for uh, diesel and, and things like that is, is that it actually tends surprisingly to be quite regressive, that most of the benefit goes to the well-off. Uh, and so there's a big push. I know that the, uh, the regional director of EMRO at WHO is thinks that that is the biggest issue um, in, in, his, in his region. Um, so I think energy policy is very important. Food policy and agricultural policy is also important. We were talking about One Health last night. But that's extremely important. Some people ask me, in the United States, what is the one worst thing we do for global health? 
And my answer is the farm bill. Um, I can explain why, but, but, but essentially, um, we, 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 we subsidize foods that put African farmers out of business. We, instead of buying local African food, we ship our surplus food. And countries do that all the time. Australia sends all of its terrible meats and its um, highly, saturated, highly saturated of, of fatty foods um, to um, uh, Papua New Guinea and other um, Fiji and other uh, uh, Pacific Islands. Uh, so it's very, very common. And so I think your, in, your intuition is exactly right, I think, that there is a very deep connection between animal health, food, animal health being zoonotic disease, food, and energy. And I think they're all, they all have very, very close interrelationships. Well, I mean, One Health is basically a movement. If you Google it, you'll, you'll come up with a lot of uh, hits. There is a One Health campaign. But basically, One Health is the idea um, that you have these interconnecting regimes of policy, law, um, uh, that, that have enormous impacts uh, on the health of the population. Um, so it would be uh, health services would be only one very small part of it, but climate change has a huge, huge impact on health. Um, we're seeing um, uh, geographical um, movement of uh, mosquitoes uh, coming up to the north. Um, it's affecting our food supply. It's affecting our water supply. Uh, it's causing uh, major dis major cataclysmic events um, like hurricanes and cyclones and things like that um, that uh, have an effect. So the idea is basically animal health, um, uh, climate change, and and in the environment, and health itself all have interrelationships, which is the One Health movement. You said you didn't want to necessarily go into talking about the WHO because it's in your book, but still. And I'll talk about it. Uh, and I'm interested in, it always seems to be an organization that has always struggled, and everyone is just always on the verge of getting better. And this time you've never had <laughs> Now it's not even on the verge. <laughs> uh, but could you, what would be two things, or one thing? That could yeah, be I mean, I had, I had this very, very small little piece uh, in, the, in the current Hastings Center report where I gave you know, five simple solutions to, that would transform WHO. I won't go through all five, but, but basically um, WHO's budget is wholly incommensurate with its global mandate. Um, it's actually about a billion dollars less than the CDC just for the US. Um, of that, uh, budget, eighty percent of its budget, WHO has no control over, um, because it's given earmarked. The Gates Foundation, the United States, the European Union, Australia, give it for their favorite projects. It may have very little connection to the global burden of disease, or anything. WHO can't do anything about it. It's earmarked for particular purposes, uh, and so no organization can succeed when it doesn't have enough money and it only controls 20% of the budget that it has. It also has a lot of difficulties um, with its regional offices. Uh, the director general has no control over its regions. During Ebola, Afro, the African region of WHO, um, uh, basically didn't call a ministerial meeting until, uh, you know, until into the very depths of the crisis. Uh, it blocked international experts and, and, and humanitarian aid. It was fighting constantly with headquarters. Again, you need one voice, one action, one WHO. And then finally, and I think this is very important, you know, Harvard thinks that the, the best chapter in the book, apart from the global health narratives, 
is the AIDS chapter. And I begin the AIDS chapter by just kind of step, taking a step back and saying, you know, how did this happen? How, how, did, how did we get to the point where UN AIDS could have a campaign saying getting to zero? Uh, how, did, how did it happen that we have medications that really can well control uh, AIDS? It's not because AIDS was a simple disease. It's a very complex, rare, and uh, retroviral disease. Um, but why? Why, was, why did the NIH and the United States and rush, rush into AIDS? Why did we form UN AIDS? Why do we have a global fund for AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria? All because of civil society all because of persons living with HIV AIDS. And most of the chapters about that, about that story. I mean, I, there was a, I was walking with my children in uh, New York City, and they had a, a, a photographic exhibition of the early days of AIDS. And they, they had no idea. They would see corpus sarcoma and wonder what it was. They would see an emaciated person and wonder what that was. So why did we make such progress with that? But with, say, mental health, we have two, two sets of antipsychotic drugs. One will give you tardive dyskinesia, which isn't the mental illness. It's the treatment. And then the other one will give you diabetes and heart disease. You know, why? And it's because of civil society and WHO shun civil society. Civil society, you know, it's, they're an intergovernmental organization. Unlike the Gavi Alliance, Global Fund, um, UN AIDS, they don't include civil society and they don't harness its power. And so I think that would be the fourth thing that I would do to change WHO. I think if you did those four things, you'd really come a long way. Can you actually answer the question Perhaps could expand on it. The failures of WHO, I want to say, a harm reputation because it sounds like it was not susceptible to much downward movement. No, it, got, it wasn't, but it did. <laughs> but what else in their response to the Ebola efforts? Okay, well, I mean, basically, first of all, they were very, very late to the party. Secondly, when they did the, finally did their cost estimates, they were wildly below what they should have been. Thirdly, uh, in 2012 to 13 budget, Margaret Chan slashed the budget. And what took the biggest hit was their epidemic response unit. So you had no, so even their technical excellence wasn't there. Um, and then they had the troubles with the uh, regional office. Um, and they were tone deaf. So Margaret Chan, you know, was quoted in the New York Times and on NPR, and uh, she said, we are not an implementing organization. We're not an operational organization. It's up to the countries themselves to contain this. And you know, she's right. They're not a service-providing organization. MSF was, and they were the heroes. But it was toned up. How could she think that Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea were in a position to fight Ebola? Uh, and in the end, uh, WHO was completely sidestepped. Uh, the United States sent in troops, didn't consult WHO. Security Council passed a resolution, and they set up a mission completely bypassing WHO. So what should have been, WHO was created for this moment, and they failed miserably. And so now the question is, why? They have recovered. They've done a lot better in the last month. Um, but they were just tone deaf, slow. And the other thing that I thought was a fatal error, you know, and I couldn't even explain this to Margaret Chan at one point, but, but she totally gets it now. Basically, she took the position 
that it was okay to completely dismantle their epidemic response unit because in the face of a crisis, countries would give humanitarian assistance because they always do in a very visible crisis, whether it's flu or the Hades uh, disaster or the tsunami, people give a lot of money. But what she failed to understand, and, and it, this is so important, she failed to understand that, that if, if a, you, it's too late to mobilize funds once a crisis hits. You have to have it in advance. And so I've suggested three fixes to prevent the next Ebola. And, and I'm very happy to say that the, this, these three ideas have gotten a ton of traction. One is a, an international emergency contingency fund. So it would be a fund that would be a standing fund that would be triggered by a global event. Uh, Jim Kim is now at the World Bank, is now um, spearheading this idea. Um, but I think it'll have to be at WHO or it'll eviscerate them. The second was what was, what was so lacking during Ebola was what? Not just money, it was human resources, it was doctors, nurses, protect, personal protective equipment. Healthcare workers were dying in droves. Um, people were being infected in hospitals and so they stayed away from hospitals. People were w lying down with Ebola, bleeding, vomiting, diarrhea on the street, waiting to get into the treatment centers because we needed staff. And so the second idea is a, what we're, we're calling a health workforce reserve, an international health workforce reserve, a cadre of well-trained doctors, nurses, community health workers and others um, who would be trained, certified, and mobilized in a crisis immediately. Because you don't want just anybody going. I had my neighbor who's a very, very good doctor. And he said to me, I was thinking of going to Liberia and uh, volunteering. And I said, please don't. They have no idea what a hemorrhagic fever is. They couldn't possibly. You need somebody who's had experience in a low-income setting. You need somebody uh, who, who's, who's, who's well-trained. And so that would be the second thing. And then the third would be an international health systems fund that I proposed in the Lancet, in the journal of the Lancet, uh, and which would be a longer-term enduring building up of health systems. Now, those three things, I think, would be really transformative. And for the first time ever, uh, in just last January, uh, the executive board in special session of the WHO uh, endorsed two out of the three of those proposals. It still has to go to the World Health Assembly and what I was just told when I, I just came back from Geneva that it probably won't get to the, the World Health Assembly until 2016, in May 2016. And you know, if there's one thing we learn is, is that we have a very short memory. And once Ebola is kept under control, I have no idea what the Health Assembly will do in 2016. It should go to the May 15 Assembly, but it's only going in interim form there. <clears throat> so, Clara, this is a um, supplement to the R word. Yes. Now, I think the R word <laughs> is really important to redistribution. Uh, and that is essential. But uh, supposing we supplement it with another term. This actually comes from Leslie and me, I think, mm -hmm. virtue of our... Those the two, the two uh, uh, top <laughs> philosophical uh, scholars in the world. So I'm not going to be able to answer the question, I can tell you. <laughs> it's, not, it's, a, it's, a, it's a suggestion that we think about also reciprocity as an element of global public health. Yes. Because mm -hmm. our about it now is we, the rich countries, should give stuff to the poor countries. Yes. And that's mm. the end of the story. Yeah. But of course, what we mm. don't ever consider is what the poor countries or the people in the poor countries can give to us. So some things. And give to themselves. Do. What? And give to themselves. And give to themselves. So reducing emissions.
from coal to cow dung to <coughs> whatever. Yeah. Um, <coughs> controlling local vectors, um, uh, permitting uh, the utilization of native plants. Totally uh, following from the rainforest. Mm -hmm. There's quite a lot uh, allowing better inspection of um, traditional health practices. Yeah. That might actually influence some of what we do. Yeah. So if we think about that as a two-way street. I couldn't agree more, Peggy. Um, it's a very, it's very like, it's insightful comment. I mean, I call it something different in the book, but it's one of the major themes in the book. Um, I, I, I label it in two different ways. I, sometimes I just call it global solidarity. And then the other term I use is mutual responsibility. Um, and, but I even... I even uh, I had more layers even than that because, the, you know, the, there, are, there are a number. Well, I can give you one great example. I, I, um, I, I, the reason I was in Geneva is I'm on this, um, this global commission called the, um, you would love the term, the Equity Access Initiative, EAI, which is really very similar to what you're talking about. And it's being, uh, it's, it's co-hosted by WHO, the Global Fund, Gavi, Unitaid, uh, UNICEF, you know, all of the big ones. Um, now, some of it is just more, you know, very, very broad. But one particular aspect of that, which, I mean, it's just one small little example of what you've said much better than I, I am going to. But one of the big questions now is whether when we give international assistance, whether you should stop giving it or give it in a differential way to middle income countries on the theory that they should be giving. So middle income countries should be giving to the global fund rather than the global fund giving to it. Um, and it's a very, very, it's a very complicated issue. But you're absolutely right. There are, there are things that countries can do for themselves and for us, and things we can do for ourselves and for them. And it is, it is these, it's, it's the reciprocality that is, I think, extremely, extremely important. Now, as I've been working in global health, there was, I've come to, both, I'm a different person now than I was when I first started because I was, I, 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 was, I was first in mental health and AIDS and disabilities and then public health and only fairly recently to global health in the last five or six years. And I used, when I first started, I thought I was very clever and then I would say there's, the, the big problem in the world is, is that um, the, the uh, poor countries don't have enough capacity um, to improve the health of their populations, and the rich countries don't have the political will to help them. And I realized I was entirely wrong. Um, and the re first of all, it, I was speaking for my northern white guilt, um, because it lets poor countries off the hook. It's insane. They spend much less of their GDP percentage-wise than higher income countries. African heads of states promised repeatedly, pledged to sp in, the, in the Abuja Declaration um, to spend 15% of their GDP on health services. Almost none of them have done it. So, you, so they have to do for themselves. When they do it, it also protects us from rapidly moving uh, infections. We have to provide um, uh, we have to fill the capacity gaps, and then ultimately that will help us because they'll stand on their own. I don't, I don't call it international assistance or aids or, or aid in the book. I call it mutual responsibility um, because I think that aid suggests a you know a an, a need and a begging and a and and a and a benevolent beneficent person giving. And I think your, your framing is much, much better, Peggy. Yeah.
So there were two last questions that I had, Robin, and yeah. So why don't we go? Why don't we take both of them? Yeah, and, and then yeah. yeah. Okay, I, you mentioned a couple of times that Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea are all close conflict, and then you noted that the United States spearheaded a resolution in the UN Security Council that this actually is a security issue. And I guess my question is, and not to get out of buying the book and reading it for myself, but uh, to what extent does your, your goal of a public health implementation plan require that it be bound up in an international, national, multinational security plan as well? Right, that's a very good question. Maybe I'll just quick, should I quickly answer it while I remember it? Sure. Okay. <laughs> That's what happened. Okay, if you, rem if you remind me, take the other one. Yeah. Okay, take the other question. If you remind me. Go ahead. Earlier on, you uh, talked about uh, a lot of progress being made in dealing with infectious diseases, apart from the world. And more and more um, issues related to uh, chronic diseases around the world. Do you see that trend as continuing in the future? And if so, um, what are the strategies you see for dealing with the chronic disease rise? Okay, so I think I do remember. Um, so you triggered one thought because in our conversation last night, I kept going back to dinner. I promised myself I was going to mention this because who was the one that was mentioning colonial? Um, the, the colonial. I think it was you, Erica. Yeah. Yes, you you made that great point about the kind of the effect of colonialism on health. I thought it was a beautiful point. Um, so you've got great law professors here. Um, and I thought I would mention one thing. Notice the way we dealt with Ebola. It was completely colonially tied. The United States gave to Liberia and Liberia only because of France with Syria and Guinea and the UK. So basically, each one followed its colonial heritage. I just thought it was really interesting. In terms of global health security, that was a whole other phase of my academic life. And I can't get into it too much. But I think the big question today is, should you securitize global health? I think there are good reasons to do it from a political, uh, self-interested point of view, but very bad reasons to do it for global health itself. So maybe that's enough said. In terms of NCDs, I should mention one thing. People think of this, um, they, they think of NCDs and infectious diseases as two, two separate categories, but they're really very interrelated. Um, for those in infectious diseases will know that I think something like 20 to 30 percent, maybe 30 percent of the cancers in the world are have an infectious or, or origin, like human papillomavirus. Um, and you have a lot of intersection between the two. It's also not true that one is chronic and the other is acute. You have a lot of chronic infectious diseases as well. Um, and it's also not true that infectious diseases are a problem of the poor and NCDs are a problem with the rich. All of those are fallacies. So given all of that, there is a very, very clear epidemiologic trans transition from infectious to chronic diseases. I think that, that that trend will be robust and it will, 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 will be with us. But it is absolutely equally clear that we're entering a very, very perilous period for novel, um, uh, highly pathogenic diseases. I think with climate change, with intense animal-human interchange that you see in Asia and Africa with backyard flocks and, 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 and farm markets and things like that, um, if, if you look at uh, congested cities, if you look at globalization and air travel, all of these things suggest that, there's, that the era of infectious diseases is far from over. Um, so we're ha we have a battle. We have a real battle um, for, for global health and justice in the world. Uh, and um, uh, we, we need to pay attention to both. We need to pay attention to security and infectious diseases. 
um, which is really on the radar right now of a lot of people. But we also need to pay attention to mental health injuries, non-communicable diseases that uh, really devastate the world's population. So I think Professor Gostin has borne out my opening claim that each of our weary lectures are uniquely stimulating and enjoyable. We have a small token oh, of our appreciation. Thank you. <laughs>